thank you for the introduction. Um, I've been asked to speak about uh, hyperdensity as, as practice. I, I find that somewhat difficult, uh, not the least because I don't know what it means. Uh, but I also, in as much as I do understand what it means, I also find it difficult to do that in Hong Kong because Hong Kong is such a default example of density, where it's questionable how many designers mingled with it, uh, that is so convincing that any density by design would almost be an anticlimax. I would like to address another subject of the conference, namely the subject of health. And in particular, I would like to talk about the political health that is surrounding the current, the current development of the city uh, as a whole. So it's a very macro topic, and it's very, very broad. Um, for the last 20 years or so, we, we live in a world uh, that has seen the end of all overt uh, ideologies in favor of economic values as the last remaining uh, source of a kind of global uh, consensus. Uh, we generally assume that this started with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the communist bloc uh, in the East. This is a profound celebration of liberty uh, at the moment when that happened. But one can seriously wonder if that's a triumph of liberty or in the end a triumph of liberalization. This is about a year earlier, Ronald Reagan, uh, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Uh, a victory claimed by, uh, in a way, a neoliberal revolution which had been set in motion, let's say, around right about 1979, 1980, with the simultaneous election of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, where the West, on the whole, uh, made a sway towards the neoliberal uh, uh, agenda, uh, which we're very much seeing panned out uh, today. Um, to some extent, I even wonder whether it's true that this revolution actually began in the West. Uh, this is yet uh, again earlier, 1978, the previous American president with Deng Xiaoping, uh, in, in, in China. Deng Xiaoping, of course, known for, uh, for changing China drastically. 1978 was the year of the open door policy, where basically China opened up to the West, welcomed free trade, and step by step uh, dismantled a, a dogmatic communist uh, ideology in, in favor of an embrace of the free market. He did that, and already then, kind of that won him the award of the American uh, Time Magazine as Man uh, of the Year. Uh, well, what happened since is, is well known, well documented and, and well known. Since 1978, uh, uh, China's economic rise has been very, very, very sharp. And what is interesting to me is the extent to which this rise is actually linked to urbanization. The two seem inextricably linked to the point that you can wonder whether urbanization is a consequence of this economic development or whether it's a means towards economic uh, development. Uh, this is the urban disposable income, the rural net income. It's very clear from this graph, if you choose to be urban, you're going to be richer. Uh, in any case, uh, you know, leaving that question unanswered, in any case, it's very clear that from then on, real estate became a very, very prominent part of Chinese propaganda. Uh, so I think that alone constitutes an answer to the question. Uh, in any case, uh, China urbanizing rapidly by 2030 uh, will have an urban community of about a billion uh, people, uh, not quite a cozy number. Um, China's development, in a way, uh, has been the model for, for many uh, developing economies today. Uh, I think this is an interesting graph that shows the relation between GDP uh, or, or state of development in GDP and, 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 and city growth. And, and what uh, is clear from this graph is that the lower your GDP, uh, the quicker your cities grow. And the more your city grows, the actually the more you propel a kind of GDP to the point uh, that one uh, sees these are the most rapidly growing uh, cities today. Places like Kabul, Lagos, Kinshasa, uh, Nairobi, and, and much to my surprise, even a place like Mogadishu is now amongst the most rapidly growing cities in the world. Um, this is the world. This is the world ranked uh, according to GDP. It's very clear that the numbers of the fastest growing cities, uh, which Ricky also showed in his presentation, to some extent play an incredible role in the catch-up that the dark part of the world is playing to the light part of the world. And one could argue that urbanization is maybe the means uh, where the world, in the end, tries to be white uh, in terms of being developed, in the end, uh, equally. Um, better for whom? was the question, and it's, it's a very important question, because 
The numbers are impressive. This is the world GDP per capita in US dollar. Uh, after the war, a sharp rise uh, from 1978, the number isn't entirely coincidental given the earlier part of the lecture, an incredibly sharp rise per capita. But at the same time, uh, an, an, an increasing inequality in the way that wealth is distributed to the point that you can ask whether an economic indicator is in any way an indicator of, of kind of great wealth for, for many, many people. Uh, an increasing asymmetry here, the more a larger part of the world lives on a smaller territory, the more also an ever smaller amount of people seem to be in possession of that wealth. Um, let's have a, a look. So uh, this is urbanization. Uh, we know that uh, recently, uh, in a way, the urban surpassed the rural uh, community in the world. Uh, rapid urbanization, but an urbanization which is also uh, rapidly uh, neck trailed by, well, I'm not supposed to use the word, let's say by the S word uh, in, in terms of development. Uh, to what extent uh, this is the city that was supposedly verging towards uh, a high density concentrated uh, city. But the more city grows, the more this is the other inextricable part uh, of the story. Uh, and, and the more uh, globally this, this kind of happen. And in a way, there is a very weird neck and neck race to the aspirational model uh, and the reality that comes with all the ac economic asymmetry that drives the system. Um, the Economics Intelligence Unit, Economic Growth, Stability, Healthcare, Culture, and that's, um, on this list, and these are the United Nations criteria uh, for human development, it's very interesting that Basically, the world's rapidly growing cities actually rank uh, large. Uh, in terms of livability, it's places like Vancouver, Melbourne, and I think also Wellington uh, who, who, who rank uh, very high. Uh, not the most exciting cities, not the largest cities, uh, uh, but kind of part of an Anglo-Saxon coziness that still apparently seems to be the dominant model, even though it's vastly outnumbered. Uh, let's look at, uh, at, at basically one of the largest growing cities in the world, Lagos. Lagos uh, in, in Africa, a city uh, built by the British with an infrastructure built by the British, an infrastructure that is meant to contain about a tenth of the population that it currently uh, contains. Therefore, uh, a city uh, deemed in a way to a perpetual regime of, of improvisation. This is infrastructure, it's a cloverleaf. Uh, it's also the largest uh, second, this is not a car park, this is the largest second-hand market in, in Africa. Uh, this is, well, I guess it's a traffic jam, but it's a traffic jam that never ends. Uh, since the traffic jam never ends, people cannot travel to commerce, so commerce travels to the traffic jam, to the point that this is not a traffic jam, but it can be reinterpreted as the largest open-air market in, in Africa. Um, let's move on. Um, this is the, the fastest growing city set off against uh, the GDP in the world. And it's largely in, in the uh, areas of, of GDP that doesn't grow extremely fast. It's also in an area that doesn't really conform to our idea of democracy. Uh, in the office, we have a particular rather crude way of ranking the world. It consists of three categories. There is democracy. There you have elections. There is dictatorship. There you don't have election. And then there is an increasingly successful category which is called pseudo-democracy. That's where you have elections, but you kind of know the outcome in advance. <laughs> a very tempting uh, model. Anyway, uh, one of the uh, pseudo-dictatorships uh, that, that we looked at is Dubai. Dubai in 1990, almost no authentic uh, community. Uh, this is Dubai uh, 13 years later. Uh, none of the urban substance here is older than 10 year. Uh, about 85% of the people that live in this substance is not from Dubai, but here the city has really been an artificial contra a construct to two minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I can also leave a very enigmatic ending and... and <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. Um, an artificial con The interesting thing here is that those uh, who govern uh, the country are actually the same people, the same CEOs of the development companies that build in the country. So the fact that they're the complete merger of a very fast uh, model of urbanization that was also uh, exported throughout the world at some point with a seeming degree of success, particularly to the part of the world 
uh, that counted as least developed and quickest uh, growing. Um, the fastest cities, the growing cities are in Asia. Asia now, uh, in a way, the majority of the world population. Uh, this is uh, another graph. It's, in a way, the growth in Asia from the moment it happened, from the 80s. And this is the most important books that architects wrote about the cities. There is a kind of rather inexplicable stop somewhere in 1978, which meant that as soon as that part of the world started to grow, the Western or the most part of the profession stopped to think. Didn't only stop to think, but also, uh, this is Jane Jacobs' last book, uh, 2004, uh, the, the, the famous film, The Dark Age Ahead. So in as much as they thought, they saw an extremely bleak future. That future is in a way now uh, the kind of domain of a very atavistic claiming of consultancies, private consultancies. This is an orgy of visions on the city you find on the internet. Uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers, they're not urbanists, they're not architects, but they talk about the city in terms of value. Jones and Langlis has real value in a changing world. McKinney, value through transformation. Where McKinsey reduces partly, uh, in a way, the city uh, to a set of performance uh, business indicators. On the other hand, we have technology, private technology companies like Siemens, who see it as the playground for technological uh, inventions, largely developed by themselves. Uh, we see Bechtel, who sees it as the domain for the acquisition of mega projects. Uh, we see water companies uh, actually privatizing water. One wonders how quickly clean air will be privatized. Um, Privatization of water also harps back that however much you privatize, in the end, the city is political, and all uh, is political. Um, political requires representation. And this is a country. That's the unit where we all go to vote. That's the standard th unit that we know as a representational democracy. Two countries uh, with their GDPs. Those countries are already outdone by megacities. We now have megacities with more people and more GDPs than countries. Interestingly enough, we have corporations which are bigger than megacities yet again. And if power flocks to the largest number, I think it's this listing of numbers that precisely indicates the current problem where the political seems to have no control over any events, whether it's climate, whether it's the economy, whether it's the city uh, or anything, and that what in a way, uh, appears necessary, the first largest, so in a way, this is the world uh, in terms of megacities. I mean, if one is utterly serious about this statistic, that in a way, 3% uh, of the Earth's surface accounts for 66% of all the economic activity, we can simply forget about a large part of the world. That's not to say that it's true, but that is one of the things that is slowly happening, that entire countries are being abandoned in the favor of competition between regions. It reminded uh, us, in a way, of an old situation, it's 30 seconds, of an old situation in the antique world, where in a way you had city-states, where in a way there was a large contested territory uh, named after individual cities, but the borders were uh, unknown. Polis, politics are intimately related, and one thing the megalopolis seems to ask for is a form of megalopolitics, a kind of new marriage between the spatial and the governmental, a new marriage between planning and administration, and a new marriage between politics and urbanism. Uh, thank you.